In this video, I'm going to discuss the GE CJ610 turbojet engine with a focus on the hot section. And on this engine, the hot section, most turbine engines, the hot section is made up of the combustion chamber, the combustor, located right here, followed by the turbine here, and finally by the exhaust, which makes up the very back half of the engine over here. For each of these, I have some pictures that go into, that are closer and have a little bit more detail, so I'm going to switch over to those uh, in order to provide a little more detailed explanation. We'll start with the combustion section, and so we are just behind the compressor. So on the left side here, we can see the final stages of the compressor, right over here. And... So the air, once it's been compressed, it's going to enter the combustion chamber. And what we want to do is we need to mix a portion of that air with atomized fuel and ignite it. And as it ignites, it'll burn and expand. And that expanding exhaust gas, we're going to use to we're going to use some of that energy to drive the compressor. We're also going to, and then the rest of the energy, the majority of it, we're going to use to produce thrust. So in order to do that, the first thing is when the air comes in, I'm going to go ahead and switch up my pen color to one that will hopefully show up a little better. The air comes in from the compressor, and it gets to this point right here, and it's going to actually split into three paths. So most of the air, roughly 80%, is going to go up this way, and it's going to go around this way. Okay. That air is really not going to be used directly for combustion, but rather it's going to provide cooling, uh, and, and, and prevent the hot combustion gases from damaging the combustion chamber as well as the turbine. About 20% of the air will go through this small opening here, and as it comes through there, it's going to enter this little chamber, and right here, it will pass through a set of swirl veins. So there's a swirl cup and swirl veins here. They're little louvers that are going to impart a swirl or almost a... Uh, it'll be a tornado kind of effect of the air. And you can see this a little better up top because there's no tape over those, uh, over those swirl veins. And in the center of those, in the center of each of those cups, is our fuel nozzle. And there's a fuel nozzle, a couple fuel nozzles sitting here in front uh, that we can look at in a little bit more detail. So our air is coming in, and that 20% goes through the fuel nozzle, and there's a fuel nozzle labeled L right here. The purpose of that fuel nozzle is to take the liquid fuel and turn it into an atomized mist. And that atomized mist uh, will be able to mix with the air and then it will become flammable to the point where it can ignite. Fuel gets to these nozzles through the, uh, through the fuel line J over here, which, is, uh, which encircles the outside of the engine, connects to each nozzle. And so that air that's being swirled, the fuel gets injected into the middle of it, or it gets, it gets sprayed into the middle of it. And then once the engine's running, it's ignited by the, the flame that's already taking place. When the engine's first starting, we have to be able to... Oops, sorry. When the engine's first starting, we have to be able to get that process started, and that's done by this igniter that's up here at the top that's kind of sticking in it. And there are two of these on each turbine engine. There are two of these uh, within each uh, combustion section. So even on a can type, there'll be two of them, but then you'll have what are called flame propagation tubes to connect the different cans. So the fuel is ignited by the igniter. Once the fuel is ignited, once the flame is started here, the igniters are actually shut off for most of the flight. They might be turned back on for critical phases like takeoff and landing uh, or in bad weather if there's a chance that the engine will flame out. But otherwise, they will uh, be shut off most of the time. So the fuel's been brought into the, into the combustion chamber, and, it's gonna, and it gets mixed with the... Uh, with the air, and that's about 20% of the air, and it's going to create kind of a swirling uh, fuel air mixture in here that's, uh, that's going to be on fire, that's going to catch, that's going to be ignited. And that's in the center of these two pieces we have here uh, are the one labeled P, you can kind of see P, is the liner, and this is an annular style combustion chamber, it's a big ring. 
Uh, and then the liner, the whole thing is inside of the housing. And the housing is the outer part, but it also is the inner wall. This is one that, that kind of trips some students up. And that is that the housing is made up of this piece up here, as well as this piece down here. Or this is your housing here, and the inner wall of your housing here. And then the liner is this area here. And right here is your combustion liner with all these holes in it. And so that, that fuel that's burning is in the center. The remaining 80% of the air, that air that went around the sides right here, this is going to come in and it's going to come out through all these holes. And same thing down here at the bottom. And it's going to create kind of a film of air on each side, of cool air on each side. So maybe my colors are off. Maybe I should call that cool air. So we got a film of cool air that kind of comes through here. And a film of cool air that comes through here. And that prevents that hot combustion gas in the center from contacting the metal. Because this combustion gas can be upwards of 2,000 degrees, which is hot enough to melt this. It's also mixing with that combustion gas. So by the time this gets back to the, uh, back to the nozzle guide vanes for the turbine, which are back here, it's cooled down enough that it's not going to melt those nozzle guide vanes. So those nozzle guide vanes are item S. Okay, the turbine nozzle guide vanes, those, those, that's going to route air, uh, the combustion gases, excuse me, into the first stage of the turbine. And so that all mixed together and is cooled, and then those, those nozzle guide vanes, S, those are going to direct the air. They're going to smooth out that, that combustion gas airflow as it goes into the turbine. We'll talk about the turbine in just a minute. A couple other components or items that we can see in this view that I just want to touch on before we move on to the turbine is you can see uh, item T right here, and there's a second one of these here, and there's another one right here. These are the bearings. This is item M is our spool shaft. So that's the shaft that connects the turbines back here with the compressors up here. And that has to rotate, that all rotates. And so the, the bearings, T, and then this other area that I've highlighted in this area here, uh, those are what allow that spool shaft to rotate. And it's rotating pretty fast on small turbine engines that can be somewhere around 40 to 60, you know, your smallest turbine engines up to 60,000 RPM or, or, or uh, 1,000 rotations per second. So that's all rotating. We also have areas uh, like in NT, you know, the bearing T right here, there's oil inside of this area to, to lubricate that, but we don't want that oil escaping out. And so item U is a seal. This is called a labyrinth seal right here. And those are used in turbine engines because they are rotating so fast, we can't have a rubber seal that wouldn't, that wouldn't hold up. And so labyrinth seals allow us to have their two surfaces that kind of interlock. I got some room at the top here where I can draw, where I can draw this as best as possible. Let me switch colors real quick. So you can see U is a surface, and it's kind of got these little fins sticking up. The part we've removed, this part here, if you look at the bottom side of it, it's this. It's also flat, and it's got pieces hanging down like this that kind of go between that. So you can see this creates almost like, when they say labyrinth, it's like a maze, where if we have oil on this side and we have air on this side, it would the oil or the air would have to go through all these little passages it would have to go in and kind of go back and forth and back and forth and back and forth or the air would have to go back and forth and that creates enough resistance that it prevents the oil and air from getting together the other thing we can do is you know we we don't want the oil particularly leaking out into the air we're not too worried about some air getting in the oil that'll be cleared out with a breather down in the oil tank and so the other thing we can do is sometimes these have a little hole in them that allows us to pump air in. So if we put a hole right here, now we can pump, pump air in under pressure and the air is going to want to go this way and the air is going to want to go this way. And that'll prevent any oil from being able to make its way through that labyrinth seal at spot U.
So a few other features that we see here. The last thing I want to point out in this area is uh, kind of down the bottom. It's hard to see, and there's an item Q right here, and you can you can see these little gear teeth along this edge. There's also another another gear right behind this bearing. It's we can't see it in this view, but those gears mesh together, and so the gear, this gear that's vertical, that one is spinning with the spool shaft that's gonna turn gear Q down here. And gear Q has a shaft going straight down and, and below this area of the engine, we can just make out this black, is the accessory gearbox. And so that's the, that's the drive for the accessory gearbox down below. And the accessory gearbox would have, you know, in a turbine engine, accessories can include things like the starter generator, maybe a starter generator that's a combined unit. Uh, it can also be a hydraulic pumps on there. You, can have, you would have fuel pumps on there, fuel controls on there. Uh, you'd have what's called a tachometer generator, which is a little AC generator that you count the pulses to know how fast the engine's turning, uh, and various components like that. Also, the starter that's down on the gearbox, that can get the engine spinning, and that's how we start the turbine engine. By, by turning the starter, it turns the gearbox, which turns Q, which turns the spool shaft, gets it spinning. That's what gets airflow through the engine. Uh, during the starting process. So let's get rid of all these before we move on. And get rid of this one back here at you. And then now we're going to move in, now that we've looked at the airflow as well as some of the features in this area, now we're going to look at once the air enters the turbine section right here. So I'm going to close this picture and I'm going to pull up a picture that is focused on kind of the front half of the turbine section. So here's our turbine section. And again, the air is coming in from the combustion chamber that's on the left. And the first thing it's going through, S right here, are the nozzle guide vanes, or inlet, turbine inlet guide vanes. Uh, and these form little nozzles <clears throat> that are used to direct the air into the turbine. And then we have our first stage turbine. These are our turbine blades right here, and these are rotating. And those are labeled Y. And then we have another set of guide vanes or nozzle guide vanes right here that are directing the air into the second turbine stage. So this is a two-stage turbine. In this engine, it's a single shaft, so both turbines are spinning the same shaft. And the whole purpose of, of the turbine on this engine is that expanding exhaust gas as it goes through and, and causes, it pushes those turbine blades, causing them to rotate. Those are going to rotate the spool shaft, and that spool shaft rotating is going to rotate the compressor section as well as the accessory gearbox. If we were on a turbofan engine, it would also be rotating the fan, which are the large blades at the front that, that bring in air to the core of the engine as well as the bypass air. So our inlet guide vanes, or turbine inlet guide vanes are S, our two turbine stages here, our two turbine uh, rotor blade stages, and then W, the section of W is our second stage uh, guide vanes or nozzle guide vanes or turbine nozzles. You've, you'll hear them described in, in several different terms. And then after the air goes through there, now in this engine, the turbine's designed to pull just enough power to drive that compressor in the gearbox, but we don't want to extract too much energy because most of the energy we want to utilize back here in the exhaust section, which we'll look at next. And the exhaust on this engine is what produces our thrust. So I'm gonna again, close this picture out. And then I have a picture of kind of the front half of the exhaust, the back half of the turbine right here. Let's open that up. And a few things you can see. So again, you can see W, these are our second stage nozzle guide vanes. And they are smoothing and directing the airflow into the second stage turbine, labeled X right here, second stage turbine blades, and those are rotating. And then from there, the air is entering our exhaust. And item Y is our exhaust cone. It's also our rear bearing housing. So the spool shaft is supported at the back end by a bearing. Yellow on yellow is not great, right down in this area right here. These items coming down to uh, item Y are just the support struts. These are what hold it in the center. And oftentimes there will be oil lines that run through that to supply oil to the rear bearing. 
clear this picture. And my next picture is further back in the exhaust. It shows kind of what we saw before. But here we have our, our exhaust section, our exhaust nozzle. So Z, which is this entire assembly here, is our exhaust nozzle. And on this engine, it is a convergent nozzle. That means it gets smaller as we go to the rear. So the diameter back here, we'll call this little d, is smaller than the diameter up here, which we'll call big D. And so what that does is the, it will accelerate the air and it will reduce its pressure. And the reason we want to do that is that, remember, the point of this engine is to produce thrust. And thrust is a force. And force equals mass times acceleration. And so nowhere in that equation is there anything about pressure. So we want to convert as much of that pressure that was built up in the further forward into acceleration. Because the acceleration here is the velocity at the inlet. Sorry, excuse me, I, I wrote that backwards. The acceleration is the velocity at the exhaust, what the velocity is leaving right here, minus the velocity at the inlet when the air enters the engine. That's our A. And the M, M right here, is the mass. That is the air plus the fuel, which is, you know, all together, that's our, ex our, our combustion gases. So the mass of the air being moved plus the fuel that's been added to it times the acceleration, the difference of velocity of the air entering the engine, minus the velocity of the air, sorry, the velocity of the air exiting the engine versus the velocity of the air entering the engine, gives us our force or our thrust that the engine's putting out. And so this engine is designed to produce as much thrust as possible by accelerating the air out as much as possible. And so it uses this convergent duct in order to do that. Now, on, this is a subsonic engine. On a supersonic engine, you will have a, a exhaust nozzle that is what's called convergent divergence. So if we have the turbine right here, the nozzle will get smaller, and then it will actually start to get bigger again. And this is on a supersonic aircraft. And what's happening there is the, the air is being accelerated here. It's, it's subsonic up to this point right here. So this is where it's subsonic, and over here it's supersonic. So it's being accelerated here. When air, or when, when gases reach supersonic velocity, the, the physics of a nozzle swap. So in the suit, once the air goes supersonic here to continue accelerating it, you actually go to a divergent nozzle, and in a divergent nozzle at supersonic speeds, that's where it continues to increase the velocity and drop the pressure. So that's why you see a convergent divergent duct on supersonic aircraft. Or what you see more often nowadays is supersonic aircraft have a duct that can change shape. And so at subsonic speeds, it necks down, it, it, it maintains that uh, it maintains that convergent shape, and then when the aircraft goes supersonic and it needs supersonic exhaust, then that the back part of that, that exhaust duct can open wider and create this convergent-divergent duct.